The glory of God is what we should desire. And the glory of God cannot be confined in a building. Amen. The glory of God goes with us. I don't know whether you've come across occasions when you, you go to a, a hawker store in a food court or something, and then there's no one in the queue. You go there, you start to buy your stuff, order your stuff, suddenly a long queue formed behind you. My wife and I believe that because we brought the presence of God there. It happens so many times. I've seen it. So bring the presence of God wherever you go. That's what the song is about. It's about living in the glory of God. Not just one and a half hours in church. Amen? Amen. But 24-7. Everyone say 24-7. 24-7. That's the revival that we need. Let's pray the prayer for illumination together. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. And that as the Scriptures are read and your Word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Amen. Part 2 of the message on revival we need. Begin with Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. The ESV, English Standard Version. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord. And not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So Paul tells us whatever, he he tells the believers in Colossae, whatever you do, which means wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever you say, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So for us, it's the same thing. Wherever we go, wherever we are, wherever the Lord puts us, whatever we do, whatever we say, we do it for the Lord. Not for your bosses, even though it is kind of for your bosses, but your primary focus, your, this is the one thing you got fixed on. That phrase is pretty catchy, right? This one thing you're fixed on is focus on serving the Lord. Even though the human masters may not be the best. It is God that we serve. Amen. Whether in church or outside church, in the marketplace or in the school or in any situation that you are serving, we serve the Lord. And as we serve the Lord, God will will give us an inheritance. You will receive the inheritance as your reward. What inheritance? is the inheritance of eternal life and abundant life in Christ for all eternity. Because when we serve the Lord, that is the reward. But serving the Lord is not always easy. As I said last week, not always comfortable to honour God and to follow Him. But it is the right thing to do. And it has that amazing reward at the end, in the end, waiting for us. So let's serve the Lord with our whole hearts. And in order to do that, we, we need to make sure we're not lukewarm. Right, we had a whole message on being lukewarm in the seven churches series. Do not be lukewarm. And how not to be lukewarm? Well, you've got to have some kind of life in you and I. That's why we need a personal revival. And today we're focusing on that. Factors that undermine a personal revival because we need one. God wants us to have one, but the enemy is going to undermine it. And I'm going to name just five factors that undermine a personal revival. There are many others, but these are the five I thought would be uh, important for us to take note of. When do you revive somebody? You revive somebody when they seem to be lying down motionless, right? That's when revival is needed. And so we need a personal revival because there's some things in us that's gone to sleep. Some things in us that God has put in us when we are born again, some things has gone to sleep and they need to be revived. And those things that have gone to sleep make us lukewarm. We don't feel passion. We don't feel warm towards God. We don't feel warm towards the things of the kingdom. And that's why we need a personal revival. I'm going to begin right now with the first one. First one is busyness. Busyness will keep us from having a personal revival. It takes away our time. It steals our time with God. 
to do the things God wants us to do. And the things God wants us to do could be things with your family, could be things with your friends, but it is God-led and not flesh-led. It could be things in the church, it could be things that develop your, your, your spiritual life, but busyness, busyness keeps us from doing all that. There used to be a book in a long time ago, probably 30, 40 years ago, written by Bill Hybels on prayer. And the book is entitled, Too Busy to Pray, but in between, there's an arrow up that says, Not. Too busy not to pray. Too busy not to pray. But that's what we always hear people say, right? I'm too busy to pray. Too busy to read the Bible. Uh, when when, when this, this particular uh, busy period is over, I, I will have more time reading the Bible. Does it ever happen? No, not really. Not really. It is a discipline. It's not comfortable. All, all kinds of disciplines are not comfortable. Nobody likes discipline. But discipline, we know every athlete. How many athletes here? Are there athletes here? Unite? No one. <laughs> or finger athletes on the phone. <laughs> All athletes, you need discipline, right, to do well. But if you are too busy to be disciplined, then you won't do well. In Psalm 127, verse 2, the message translation, MSG, not, not that MSG that we put in food, but MSG for the message uh, translation, it's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? Who are the people who rise early and go to bed late? Workaholics. Workaholics. You wake up early, go to bed late, they just do and do and do like the Mary and Martha thing how Martha was just busy, 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 and, and spending time with the Lord was not her priority. Getting work done was her priority, even though it seems like someone has to get the work done, someone has to cook the food, someone has to serve the food. I've talk, spoken to women who are busy, like feels a sense of responsibility, need to do that. They think Martha is right, that someone has to do it, if both of them sit at Jesus' feet, who's going to serve the food, right? Well, Jesus said, Mary chose what is better. I believe what was happening is that Martha was overworking. And that's what we tend to do. We overwork. Work, hard work is encouraged in the Bible. So, Igniters, don't go home and tell your parents, pastor say, no need to work hard. Must work hard. The book of Proverbs says, you sluggard, that means you lazy bum, look at the ends, how they store food for winter, how they work hard to store food for winter. Work hard by all means, but don't cross the line. What is the line? You cross the line when your hard work compromises your relationship with God, your walk with God, and compromises you doing what God asks you to do. Serve in where God wants you to serve. Even, and that would even include having a good relationship with family, with spouse, with, friend, with siblings. When we overwork and overclock, it is a problem. And that is what this verse is all about. It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? To find rest in God is important. And in Isaiah 58 verses 13 and 14, the Lord says, If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honourable, if you honour it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly. All right, the next verse will talk about the blessing. All right, but here in verse 13, the Lord saying that honor the Sabbath, honor the rest day. The rest day is, and it's not just for physical rest, but it's for worship, it's for resting in God and growing, not just taking care of your physical needs, but also your spiritual needs. We are to honour the Sabbath and choose 
it to be a holy day, not do what we are pleased with on that holy day. Which is why coming to church on a weekend or a Sunday, it is important that we make time to come to church to rest, to learn, to grow spiritually and honour God. Take time to just walk with God. Not, not just this one and a half hours or two hours, but beyond Sunday, what you do the rest of Sunday, to just take time to walk with God and let the Lord walk with you. And then verse 14 says, Then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So the blessing of God, the delight that comes from the Lord, giving us favour to ride on the heights of the earth, having God supply, that comes from honouring God and having Sabbath. We all know whether as a worker or as a student, when we have proper downtime scheduled and we are rested, we work better after that, right? We become a better worker. There are companies who, I don't know whether they, they still do now, but back in the late 80s, I read an article in the, in, in the Straits Times about companies who gave sabbatical leave. Seven years of service, you get three months paid leave or six months paid leave or 10 years of service, you get five months paid leave, things like that, Sabbath. And the reason these companies, which I remember reading, it included at that time, Apple Computers, JVC, and Motorola. They gave sabbatical leave because they say our employees come back better employees once they're well rested. Yeah, they don't come back more tired because they had so much fun. They actually like use their time meaningfully, they rested. They come back better employees. So we all know too, a student that studies straight eight hours compared to another student who studies an hour, rest 10 minutes, an hour, rest 20 minutes, an hour, rest half an hour, an hour, rest 10 minutes, and just open up and have downtime, that second student will probably do better. If providing, assuming they have the same degree of intelligence, all right? So Sabbath is important and the Lord will bless us when we honour Him on the Sabbath. So are you too busy with life such, as, such that your walk with God is compromised, your ministry in the Lord is compromised? They, I can't do it, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. But actually, sometimes we're just busy with Korean drama <laughs> or some other pastime and entertainment. Don't let the enemy rob you of a truly abundant life in the Lord by keeping you busy. You missed out. So the second factor is complacency. Complacency can keep us from having a personal revival as well. Now complacency is about, is, is, is about becoming proud. The dic dictionary definition, a feeling of smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. Uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievement. A feeling of smart, so kind of like, I'm okay. I think I'm okay. I go to church every week. I serve also in the ministry. I think I'm okay. And sometimes you are really okay, but sometimes you're not. You may be doing those things, but you're not okay because you're doing these things mechanically. You're doing these things without a heart. And there's no, no passion to grow, no sense of excellence. You're just doing the things. You know, a lot of the ministries in church, we can give it to non-believers and they can also do it. Do you need to be Christian to do community fridge? Do you need to be Christian to do ushering? Do you need to be Christian to play music? Actually, it can be done by non-Christians. In fact, I know of churches in the past, they've hired non-Christian musicians because they don't have skilled enough musicians in their own church. They'd rather have professionalism than offering. Scary. So every, every week, they pay a team to come and lead worship, and some are non-Christians. The non-Christians don't mind playing because they've got money. Be careful about complacency. Don't think that just because we're in the church doing some of these things, we are 100% okay all the time. 
As we often say, being in the church doesn't make you a Christian, just like being in a garage doesn't make you a car. Being a Ferrari factory doesn't make you a Ferrari. You can drive a Toyota to a Ferrari factory, it still be a Toyota. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Now he's not encouraging competition here. He's encouraging the right attitude in running. Not competition. Because actually the prize in the Lord, there's plenty of top prizes to be earned. It's available for everyone who runs with an excellent spirit. There's not just the one prize and you, 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 inch, you, you edge out each other to get that prize. So, but run in such a way, serve in such a way, come to church in such a way as to attain that prize, to, to be excellent, to be a worshipper who is truly immersed and not conscious of the people around you, to offer to God uninhibited praise, selfless sacrifice, to offer to God service that is from the heart, not out of drudgery. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So there's discipline and focus involved if you want to run to obtain the price that is in the Lord, to have an excellent spirit in the marketplace, at home, in church, wherever we go. God's desire for us is to come alive, to have that revival that makes us alive in the spirit so that whatever we may face, we are alive, we become victorious, we have God on our side. But there may be times of defeat, but it will never keep us down, we will get up. There are people who are knocked down and they stay there, right? Let's never be that. The third factor that undermines a personal revival is cultural assimilation. Cultural assimilation. Now, what is cultural assimilation? Well, it's two weeks ago, Dr. Liao, let me quote him again. He said, water is to the fish just as culture is to the human being. So culture is like water all around us is there. We need it to survive. Fish needs water to survive. Fish is moved by water and influenced by water. We are moved by culture and we're easily influenced by culture if we're not careful, right? And culture gets to us. So cultural assimilation is the process in which a minority group or culture comes to resemble a society's majority group or assimilates the values, behaviours and beliefs of another group, whether fully or partially. The church in society is a minority group in a, the larger society. We are a minority group in a big society. And the big society can influence this minority group. The culture of the world that we live in can influence us and change us and turn us into something that we were not supposed to be. For instance, those of you who are my age or older, you will remember, like, let's say, go back 40, 50 years ago, the moral fabric of society is very different from today. The morals that people held on to then, families held on to them, very different from today. I mean, I think I've told this story before, but it's a good story to tell again. I was about 10, 11 years old. There was an 18, 19 year old, pretty hot girl in my neighborhood. Ooh, I heard that sounds like a sack one voice. <laughs> well, I was primary six and I knew what hot was. And she came home one day with her boyfriend. And they slept together. You know what I mean? They didn't just snooze together. They... All right? And the father came home early from work that day for some reason, came home early, found them, and literally kicked her out of the house and told her not to come back. Today's parent, however, maybe the mother will say to the father, dear, it's okay. La. Just close one eye. La. It's all right. They're going to get married after all. They've been dating for two years already. It's okay. Like, he lives so far away. He's just resting. 
It's okay, lah. Right? And they consider, we consider ourselves enlightened, right? Progressive parents, that we are better than parents 50 years ago. Okay, some of you will remember this. Some long time ago, I think, maybe 40 years ago in the 80s, when the US government, sorry if you're American here, sorry. Uh, my apologies, but uh, just stating facts, what happened. I'm uh, just stating an account of what happened. I don't know if it's a US president or somebody criticized Singapore for our capital punishment. Remember? We were criticized for our capital punishment and we were considered barbaric society. We were considered, oh, this, you were like US in the 60s. Our minister's response, I can't remember who could be the PM at the time, was this simple. I believe you were a better society then. Wow, power man. I remember reading it, I thought, so true. You're a better society then. But look, over the decades, it's so easy. The culture around us has shaped us. We assimilate and we become something that we were not supposed to be. So we've got to be careful. We are in the world, but not of the world, the Bible says. First Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. We are foreigners, we are strangers in a strange land. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. Don't do what they do. We, our citizenship, we got a dual citizenship, some people say, one of our citizenship is in heaven. I know Singaporeans not allowed to a citizenship, but this one can. We are citizens of heaven and we're just passing through. Don't, don't pursue the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So we are Strangers in a strange land, we are to abstain from the pleasures of the flesh. Take note, pleasures, which means what? It will make you pleasurable. It will give you pleasure. You will love it. You'll be drawn to it. You'll be tempted by it. But the Bible says abstain. Now, when you abstain from something pleasurable, it's called following your heart, if you heard last week's sermon that makes, gives you pleasure, it's difficult, right? It's difficult. We don't like it because every carnality in us, we want that thing. We want to do that whatever. But as sojourners, as foreigners in a strange land, we are supposed to abstain. Jesus says in John 17, I do not ask that you keep them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So we're in the world, we live in this environment, but we have to consciously remember we do not take on everything that this world gives us. And they will give you. They will give you. And in fact, the better looking you are, the more people will give you something. The more the temptation will be. Somehow, the better looking people, well, that's the downside of being good looking. You're like, honey, the bees will come. So be careful. Be careful what people offer you. If you're in different traits, somehow they spot the good looking ones and they come after you and they give you stuff, they offer you stuff, get you to do things. Be careful. Be careful. The fourth factor is permissiveness. Permiss permissiveness. All right? It's different from complacency. Complacency is being smug and having an uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievement, right? But permissiveness is allowing or characterized by great or excessive freedom of behavior. To allow 
excessive freedom of behaviour. Freedom of behaviour is a good thing. Freedom is a good thing in general, but we're talking about excessive freedom of behaviour. This came from the dictionary. Excessive freedom. Clearly, it is negative. A parent, if you're a parent and you give, you're very permissive, it means you give excessive freedom to your kid to do anything. They will love it. Those group there, they want excessive freedom. And then they, most of the time, young people are complaining, my parents are so strict. They don't give me any freedom. And then they have a friend in school, comes from a home for whatever reason, the parents give total freedom. Total freedom. The kids get jealous and they get angry with us for being such bad parents, for controlling them, for not giving them freedom. Now, when you become permissive, on the one hand, it's true, the kids will grow. They can, they can grow in a way that restriction will only inhibit that growth. It's possible, but it's also highly possible they do a lot of nonsense. And can end up in jail because create all kinds of videos on YouTube. There was a one kid in Singapore, we all know his name. Free, parents gave him a lot of freedom. Initially, the parents will watch the video he created. The, he, he upload, then approve, then upload. Then after, they're so proud of him. Like, at such a young age, he's making videos. They're so funny, so amazing. He's so eloquent. Yeah, this funny, eloquent boy grew up, became quite a monster. And started to upload all kinds of nonsense, anti-government, anti-God, anti-Christ. And eventually, ran away from Singapore like an exile. Right? That's because parents were permissive. Be careful of permissiveness. What are the kind of permissiveness? Well, Judges 21, 25, in the last verse, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's, that's being permissive. You just do whatever you want. Boy, girl, do whatever you want. Imagine a boss, an employer being permissive. Tell the employee, do whatever you want. Come in whatever time you want. Somehow, Singaporeans are just too clever. If, you're given, if we're given a kind of freedom, I think the company will collapse. First Samuel chapter 2, we see a father who was permissive, Eli. And in verse 12, is this amazing but terribly scary verse that says, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. Oh, how often do you read this in the Bible? So and so, they're worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Worthless, they did not know the Lord. That was God's judgment right there. And that's scary. Why were they worthless? Well, at some point, the Lord says, you honour your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people, Israel. You see, what was happening was that the sons were requiring more privilege, more offering than they deserve. They were asking for the best. They were asking for more, depriving the people. They were robbing the people of the nice meats, they were consuming it, and the father, Eli, was consuming it too. Apparently, knowingly, but at some point in his old age, in verse 22, it says, now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, not just robbing the people of the, the, the sacrifice, the meats, but more than that, he says, you lay with the woman who was serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Verse 22. Lay with the woman who was serving at the tent of the meeting. Now, these are pastor's kids. Right? Hophni and um, Phinehas. They were priest's kids, but they were also PK, also pastor's kids. So imagine the pastor's kids were sleeping around with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The ushers. Ushers. Be careful of pastor's kids. (laughs) 
And, and the fathers told them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. But it says in verse 25, they will not listen to the voice of their father. They will not listen. You can score, you can teach, but they will not listen. And, and Eli did nothing more. And because he did nothing more, such as he could have remove them from their position so that they don't have the authority to order people around. Or they could, he could punish them in some way, but he did not. And because he did not, he was, the Lord said, you honour your sons above me. You have honoured your sons above me. And the punishment was severe, very severe. Let me read to you from verse 32. No, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. That means they're not going to live very long. Then in distress, you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. Now, first of all, say there shall not be an old man in your house. Then now the second round, he says, there shall not be an old man in your house forever. And the only one, verse 33, the only, and only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar. So he will spare one. Eh? God will spare one. But you know for what reason? I shall not cut off from my altar, shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart. Oh, the punishment is severe. Even the one spared was meant to spare so that he'll grieve like crazy, weep his eyes out. Because the rest dies. And all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this that shall come upon your two sons. So your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, these two pastor's kids, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. To show that God is the one who judges. God is the one who punishes. For the father was permissive. Well, the sons were sinful, but the father was permissive. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17, we know this verse. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, when we look at this verse, the four things there, teaching, reproof, correction, and training, we tend to focus on teaching and training, isn't it? So we, we do teaching like we do teach the Bible, and then training for us is defined this way. So I do, you watch. Next time, I do, you help. And then the third stage, you do, I watch. So training, God, so this is how you do the ministry. This is what you do. This is how you do. All right? Training, teaching skills, imparting skills. And so we, we are big on this, teaching and training, but we have, we're very careful about reproof and correction. All the four words here, they have different, they are from different, they, they have, uh, I mean, they're from different Greek words. So teaching there refers to instruction and doctrine. The training there does not refer to the kind of training I just described. In fact, the training there refers to the whole training and education of a child. It's a very exhaustive and comprehensive training for them to grow up and as adults to cultivate their souls and curbing. It's about cultivating the souls and curbing passions. Hey, that's the training. It's not just learn how to do this but learn how to, what to become, what kind of man or woman to become. Instruction that is aimed at increasing virtue. And it includes the idea of chastisement. You know what is chastisement? It's rebuke or reprimand that is severe. Not just rebuke, but severe rebuke. Not just reprimand, but severe reprimand. So the training is really shouldn't be in blue. It should be in bright, bright red. Reproof, the Greek word for reproof there refers to convicting a person of their sinfulness. Not just scolding. 
but convicting them of their sinfulness. And the correction there refers to restoring a person to an upright state. Not just say only, but act and to restore the person to an upright state or improvement of life or character. So this, this, this is what Scripture is for. 2 Timothy 3.16 is about life change. Not just teaching and training. Let's hold a class. Let's teach, let's train. We've done 2 Timothy 3.16. No. We're talking about very serious and thorough and radical discipleship. That's what CGs should be doing. CGs, DGs, that's what you should be doing. Radical, life-changing discipleship. But in order to achieve that, you've got to give permission to each other. So I hope you will voluntarily tell each other, whether in the CG or a DG, I want to give you permission to correct me when I'm wrong. Even if I don't react very well, please just tell me. I may need a little time to get over it, but I will listen. I promise I will listen and I'll think about it. But don't mind me, I may not respond very well initially. But still, please do it. If you love me, please do it. If we do this church, we will never be the same again. If we give each other such permission, we as a church will not be the same again. Without accountability, without this kind of accountability, the CG is just a social club. We may tickle our minds with some Bible study, but, but study without application is really of not much use. And the application we're talking about, accountability. Otherwise, we might as well throw out the CG idea completely. And when we are permissive with one another, it means this. It means we fear men more than we fear God. It means that our standing with men is more important than our standing with God. It means we want to please men more than we want to please God. Pleasing God can displease men. Having a good standing with God can mean a low standing with people. But your standing with God will be good. So what will we choose? Popularity? Is this a popularity contest? You want to be popular? Fine. Then you choose to please men and fear men rather than fear God. And you'll be held accountable for being permissive. Fifth factor and the last one, materialism. Materialism. And it's defined this way, the tendency to consider material possessions and physical comfort above and more important than spiritual values. The tendency to consider material possessions and physical comfort as more important than spiritual values. That's materialism. When we just want material things and physical comfort. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 3 to 6, the word of the Lord came, to, came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. And in verse 4, it says, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and have and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does, does so to put them into a bag with holes. Let me be, just talk about verse 4 first. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panel houses while this house lies in ruins? They were ignoring the fact that the temple of God was in ruins, in disrepair. And they even, they claimed to be poor, but yet they were putting money to build their own panel houses, to live comfortably. It was all for themselves. God is marginalised. God is on the edge. Not important. And I say, look at our church building, it looks like we, did, we, we put a lot of money and effort into to this physical building at least. But if you apply this to our lives, it's, we are so often guilty of pleasing ourselves, of building our own sphere, our own domain, and not building God's domain, isn't it? 
we, we, we place priority. It's all me, me, me. It's all about me. And God was rebuking His people. Is it time? Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your penitent houses while this house lies in ruins? Is it a time for you to build your life and become so successful while, while what I've called you to do, you're not responding? And you leave your spiritual house in ruins. And then the Lord says, consider your ways. Think about what's going on, you idiot. Okay, that's my own addition. <laughs> consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. I'm sure God thought it. <laughs> you eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you earn wages and put them in bags. With holes, which means what? Whatever you do, God hasn't blessed it. Don't you get it? Whatever you do, I'm not blessing it because of your disobedience, because you're building your own kingdom, your own domain, you're ignoring what I have in my mind. You're ignoring, you're building your own kingdom and ignoring my kingdom, neglecting my kingdom. And I'm, I'm showing you that there's no blessing in doing such things, and yet you're not getting it. Consider your ways. It's a severe warning. I like uh, what these commentators, Jemison, Fawcett and Brown said in their commentary, their joint commentary, referring, regarding this passage, nothing has prospered with you while you neglected your duty to God. You never have good, really true prosperity. The punishment corresponds to the sin. They thought to escape poverty by not building but keeping their money to themselves, God brought it on them for not building. Instead of cheating God, they had been only cheating themselves. So true. A life without honouring God, putting God first, a life that is not a life in the spirit, but dead in the spirit, a, that life God cannot bless. When we want to pursue carnal things instead of the things of God, God cannot bless us. He will not we sang earlier on the song, Reward by Josh Yo, a local song. And there's this line in the song that fits the message today. What would it profit me to gain the world but lose my soul? I know my life is not my own. What would profit me, what would it profit me to gain the world but lose my soul? I know my life is not my own. Scripture says in Corinthians, that we've been bought with a price. You and I, we've been bought with a price. We, this is not of our own. Our, we, don't, we don't own our, this life. You and I, we've been bought with a price. We've been redeemed with a price, a costly price, the life of Jesus himself. And we do not own this life. But as we serve the Lord, the Lord blesses us. He's not, he's not a bad master. We're told in Scripture, right, he's a good and humble and a lowly and gentle master. Bob Dylan say in his song, Gotta Serve Somebody, he says, you, you can serve, you, can, you gotta serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you gotta have to serve somebody. You, we think sometimes if we don't serve God, we are just serving ourselves. No, seriously mistaken. If we don't serve God, we end up serving the devil without realizing it. And the devil is laughing his way to the bank. What are the five factors that undermine a personal revival? Business, complacency, cultural assimilation, permissiveness, materialism. In order to be a Christ follower in a place of revival, we need the help of the Holy Spirit a fresh encounter with God that transforms us from glory to glory. Life is unpredictable. We don't know what tomorrow brings. And we want to do well in the Lord's eyes. We want to finish well. It's one thing to start well, but it's quite another to finish well. Let me end with this. At 12.30 last night, at mid, just past midnight, I got a call. 
from a friend of our church member. And he said, you're Pastor Barnabas? I said, yes. He said, um, one of your church members has a family bereavement. A family member just died. I said, who? He told me the name of the parents and I said, their son, Sean, 21 years old, just died. I said, what happened? I was so shocked. Same cell group as my son. And apparently he had fever on Friday. He came home from army camp after seeing the army doctor, given Panadol, which is usual. And Saturday night, he was alone at home while the family was out for Mother's Day dinner because he was not well. He decided to rest. They came back, he had collapsed on the bathroom floor and there was no pulse. The father tried to do CPR, call the ambulance. They did resuscitation for two hours and then pronounced him dead at about just past midnight. Sean was in church last week. He plays the keyboard for Ignite. He loves serving the Lord. His mother also plays the keyboard with the main service. And it's just gone like that. We're still waiting for the coroner's report or autopsy report to find out exactly what went wrong. But he's gone. I looked at his body at 1.30 a.m. It was difficult to look at Sean. This whole thing, we're still trying to make sense of it. I don't know whether we would ever. But you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me that life is short. Like a vapor. Jesus, the book of James says, life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. Church, I, I'm not using this to scare you, but this is the reality. This is the reality. So what? If you have another 15, 20 years, how are you going to spend it? How are you going to spend your last 15, 20 years? You want to wait till the last week of your life and say, and said, I, I should have done more. I could have done a lot more that God has called me to, but I didn't. I regret it now. You still go to heaven, I think, unless I'm, God is not as kind as me. I think you still go to heaven. But what a, what a letdown. What a letdown. What a letdown to stand before the Father who receives you as, your, as his child and come in and say, God, I did nothing for you. I'm so sorry. Will you send me back? Let me start again. I'm going to change the way I live. What a letdown. We need to come alive as a church, as an individual, as individual believers. We cannot waste God's time. He's given us time on earth. And some of us know that because we've received grace. We've had near-death encounters and we are still alive. You know, for some people, they, they come, come back from a difficult situation, medical situation, they come back and they want to enjoy everything about life because what if I really die soon? Then I missed out. I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And they forget God who saved them and bring them back. And they do what they want, to do what is right in their own eyes. Then there are others who say, God gave me a second chance. And the rest of my life, the rest of my days, every day is for the Lord. What will you choose, church? Young people, you just lost one of your own. What will you do? You can still play mindlessly, just keep going, keep going, keep going until you crash or you can choose to learn from this as a church 
we can all take note, take heed and learn from this. You're not going to live forever, my friends, no matter what age you are. Recently, 17-year-old JC girl just died in a car accident. We do not know, but what we do know is today, you and I can serve the Lord. Amen. Today, you and I can serve God and follow Christ. So church, what do you want? Revival has to begin with us. If you do not experience a coming to life and a revival in yourself, we have no light to shine. Let us pray. Can I invite you to stand? Let's just stand for a moment in honour of Sean. Like all of us, Sean is not perfect. But Sean is a good kid. And he loves the Lord. He's eager about serving in the worship ministry. Let's honour him at this moment. Lord, our hearts are broken. We don't know where to think, what to think, where to, we, where to even begin. Truly, when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. One thing we do know, Lord, that we will see him again. So we pray for the family, for Jeff and for Si, and also for Chloe. That you comfort them, Lord, with the comfort that only you can bring. Help us to be there for them over the next few days. We don't get it, Lord. But we know you can't be wrong. We know you're not unloving. We know you cannot do wrong because you are righteous perfectly righteous Lord we pray that this may serve as a reminder to us all to get right with you to, to get right with you Lord to let not the enemy win you've called us your sons and daughters you've called us sons and daughters with a divine call a divine mission 
For you said in your word, we've been created for workmanship. We've been created in advance for workmanship. So Lord, put our hands to the plow and help us to never look back. Pour out your Spirit upon us, Lord. That each of us, no matter what age we may be, how old, how young, Lord, we may live each day to glorify you. So take away every carnal passions, passions of the flesh. Consume us. Consume us with your divine spirit, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. Consume us with your fire. Fire from above that will purify, that will make us holy. They will change our lives, O oh God, for Your glory, O oh God, for Your glory, O oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, give me a fresh, fresh fire. 